The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Dust or God? Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee that thou art our God, and that there is none like unto thee. How we worship thee, because thou art the God of all wisdom, and all justice, and all love, and holiness, and goodness. And thou hast loved us, and made it possible for us to approach thee through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee that we can know that thou dost receive us, even as a father receives a child. Bless each listening heart in this hour, we pray thee. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying in the epistle to the Romans and come to the ninth verse of the eighth chapter. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We have already seen in our studies in the earlier chapters of this epistle that there is absolutely nothing of God in the Adamic man and that God has given him over, abandoned him to his own ways. The argument that is most usually advanced against this truth is that the Bible teaches that man was made in the image of God. So it's necessary for us, therefore, to stop and discover the nature of the image of God in man and to find whether the coming of sin affected that image in any wise and then to find out what the work of the Holy Spirit in any man in regeneration does about this image. In the first place, it must be realized that the image of God in which Adam was created was not a physical image, but a moral and intellectual likeness. The proof that the image was not a physical image lies in the fact that the Lord God Almighty is spirit and does not have a physical image. When the Lord Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in the fourth of John, he said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now our next step is to find out the characteristics of spirit. And this is taught in the doctrine of the resurrection. Speaking of his own body, the Lord Jesus said to Thomas, Handle me and see, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me to have. Now if we put these two verses together, we discover that God is spirit and does not have flesh and bones. We therefore come to the conclusion that God is invisible personality with knowledge, feelings, and will but without corporeity, without a body. His personality consists of his individuality and his moral and spiritual qualities and all of the other characteristics that go to make up personality and individuality, such as unchangeableness, his perfection of power, wisdom, authority, and in the highest degree his sovereign will, his love, and all of the other characteristics of that warm being that is bound up in love and a definite determination to accomplish everything in behalf of those whom he has loved. Now, when Adam was created, he was given these divine attributes, but he used his will to seek power and independence for himself, and as a result, immediately lost the image of God. Now, this is not an assertion but will be backed by many scriptures, as we shall see. In the fifth chapter of Genesis, we are taught that the children of Adam were in his own likeness and after his image. Now, this was a totally different concept than that which had come from God in the original creation. The image of Adam was an image of willfulness, an image of disobedience, an image of ignorance, an image of sin, an image of death. The image of God was sinless, unchangeable. The image of Adam was an image of destruction, decay, and dissolution. Now, if it be objected that we say that the image of God was unchangeable and that Adam changed, we reply that the change was not a degradation of the divine nature, but the loss of the divine nature and the assumption of a different nature, totally depraved, alien from God. Now, another objection may rise from the fact that there are many physical descriptions of God given to us in his word. We read that the arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save, that his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. We read that his hand is stretched out to help and that the government shall be upon his shoulder. 
we find that the eye of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth and that his feet shall tread down his enemies. We find that the scripture is said to go forth from his mouth and that his voice is like the voice of many waters. And we're told that he will cast our sins behind his back. Now, in spite of all these references, anatomical references to the human body, we know that the New Testament verses are correct and that God is spirit and does not have flesh and bones. For these that we have read are figures of speech, beautiful figures of speech. They convey to my mind and heart the truth that as I would watch over my child with physical eyes, so the Lord will watch over me with spiritual eyes that he will know me better by watching me than I will ever be able to know my child by watching him. They show me that as I would listen to my child, so God will hear me. And they show me that since God does not have any back and has cast all my sins behind his back, he has put my sins in a place that is not, and that he will never hold them against me anymore forever. Now these are figures of speech, and they must be understood with the others that speak of him as covering us with his feathers and placing us in safety under his wings. Now, God is not a bird, though he can teach us with this imagery of feathers and wings. Now, there is one sense in which the image of God in man is that of the Trinity. God is a Trinity, and he has made us as a Trinity. A flower, for example, is a unity. It has a body, but it has no soul or spirit. Cut it down, it will die. Transplant it, it will not seek to go back to the place of its origin. It has nothing more than body. But the animal, however, is duality. The animal has a body and a soul. The Hebrew word nefesh, soul, is used of animals on several occasions in the Old Testament. And this is why the Lord Jesus was able to say, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The reason why the fox returns to its hole and the bird to its nest is because there is an individuality there, an animal personality that lifts it above the vegetable, the flower, or the tree. In the animal there is duality, there is body and soul. But the animal does not lift up its eyes to God. There is no beast, be it ever so high in the scale of animal development, that ever came out of its lair to heap together stones for the offer of a sacrifice. There is no beast which prays, and yet there is no man, be he ever so low in the scale of humanity, who has ever failed to do exactly this thing. The reason is evident. Man is a trinity. Man has a body, man is a soul, and man has a spirit. Yes, man is a trinity, made in the image of the trinity. And this is why man lifts his thoughts to his creator. Someone once said that man is a religious animal but it's far more than this. Man has the vestigial remnants of the divine creation, and while much of it has been marred by sin, the characteristics of his being still leaves him the noblest of all God's creation. Yet, in spite of this fact, the moral and spiritual aspect of the image of God was lost in Adam the moment he turned away from God. This is best discovered by noting the contrast which the Bible sets forth between the nature of Adam's being and the nature of Christ's being. In the great resurrection chapter addressed to the Corinthians, we have a revelation concerning the nature of our present body and that which we shall have in the resurrection. We read, it is sown in corruption, perishable. It is raised in incorruption, imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. And then comes the very important distinction. It is sown a natural body, a physical body. The literal Greek reads a soulish body. It is raised a spiritual body. In other words, our present body is dominated by our fallen soul. Our resurrection body shall be dominated by our risen spirit. The passage then continues, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. The difference is evident. Adam did not have life in himself. Christ does. Adam could communicate nothing more than physical life. 
Christ is the author of all life and communicates spiritual, eternal life. And then we read, continuing still in that passage in Corinthians, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Dust or God, that is the difference between the nature of Adam and the nature of Christ. That is the difference between what I was by nature and what I am by grace. And then comes this revelation. As is the earth, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now in those verses, we have the flat declaration that Adam in his fall and all who sprang from him have an image that is of the earth, earthy. Furthermore, it is stated that our relationship to the heavenly image is a future one. We shall bear the image of the heavenly. Now let us turn to those passages in the epistles which show that the coming of the Holy Spirit into the life of an individual at regeneration brings with himself the image of God. Paul writes to the Colossians, Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now here, the Adamic nature is presented as being the essential being of the fallen man. The believer is told that he is to put off the old man, the image of fallen Adam, and that he is to put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. It should be noted that the renewed image is an intellectual one. We know from Corinthians that the natural, soulish man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them, they are spiritually discerned. But it's the coming of the Holy Spirit into the life of the believer that brings the intellectual powers that enable a believer to understand the spiritual matters which could never be known by the natural intellectual processes of the fallen mind. In John's first epistle, this same truth is set forth. Among the things that the believer can understand with his newly given nature is that his process of understanding is now a divine one. For there in that epistle we read, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, so that we may know him that is true. 1 John 5.20 So the knowledge of Christ is a supernaturally given knowledge that comes with the presence of Christ in our hearts the regenerative presence of the Holy Spirit. This is why no man calleth Jesus Lord save by the Holy Spirit. And this again explains our text still further. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Oh, the world hates this attitude in the believer, but we can take no other attitude. We know that we know, and that is all there is to it. We know that we have a new life, and with the new life, that we have the new knowledge. We know that it's divine. It's a fact that's more certain than our breathing. It should be noted also that the tense of the Greek verb in the Colossians passage is a present continuing one. The King James Version states that the new man is renewed in knowledge after the divine image. The Greek states that we have put on the new man which is being renewed in knowledge after the divine image. God has not planted within us that which is a dull weight of accomplished fact, but rather the living spirit who keeps on being what he is in his divine nature. God has not put something static within us, but a spring, a flowing spring, and that life of the Holy Spirit is the source of all life. He is in us and he can do nothing other than act according to his being. He must keep on pouring forth life, and that life is within us now when we are born again, and he will keep on pouring through us forever and forever. Now there's a further passage, this time in the Ephesian epistles, which points out that this image is also a moral and spiritual image, in addition to being an intellectual one. 
This important paragraph in Ephesians first describes the characteristics of the Adamic nature. We read that unregenerate men walk in the vanity, the futility of their mind, having the understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their blindness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to licentiousness to practice greedily every kind of uncleanness. Now, with that description of the natural Adamic nature in mind, the apostle turns to talk about the contrast that is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the new believer. You have not so learned Christ, he tells them, assuming that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And then follows the exhortation based on these truths. Man's ruin in Adam and the Holy Spirit's transforming work in Christ. Put off your old nature which belongs to your former manner of life. Put it off like you would put off dirty linen. Put it off because it is corrupt through deceitful lusts. And then the exhortation becomes positive. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new man, the new nature, which after the image and likeness of God is created in true righteousness and holiness. The Colossians passage stresses the intellectual aspect of the new life, which we receive when we are created anew in the image of God by the work of the Holy Spirit in our regeneration. The Ephesians passage stresses the moral and spiritual aspect of this new life, which comes when we are renewed in the image of God. This life is in true righteousness and holiness. True righteousness, of course, is the opposite of human righteousness. You must never fall into the trap of thinking that human righteousness is just a lesser form of divine righteousness or that divine righteousness is just a higher form of human righteousness. The two righteousnesses are totally different in their essences. It is when I am born again, made alive in Christ, that I am made the righteousness of God in Christ. We are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now note the order of this last promise, which we quote from 1 Corinthians 1.30. Christ Jesus is made unto us, first, wisdom. That is what we have seen as the first characteristic of the renewed image brought by the Holy Spirit. We have been given the divine understanding that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Second, Christ Jesus is made unto us righteousness. We know from the Old Testament that all of our old righteousnesses are as filthy rags. This is to be put off like an unclean garment. We're immediately clothed then in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it becomes more than a garment. It becomes our, our central, essential being. We are not only clothed in righteousness. We are righteousness in Christ. And this is because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us, bringing the righteousness of God to become the very warp of our being. Now we can understand our text. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And then third, Christ Jesus is made unto us sanctification. This word is the same as holiness. One of the words has a Latin origin and the other comes from the Anglo-Saxon. In short, this is the Holy Spirit entering into our lives to form Christ in us. It is nothing short of this that is acceptable to God. Therefore, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I once heard a theologian from Czechoslovakia give an excellent illustration of this optical illusion in the field of theology. He spoke of the fact that there were certain philosophers who had an extremely high concept of truth and righteousness. Their writings showed that they were very near to true Christian thought in their declarations. And yet, there was a profound difference between them and us. Finally, he said he discovered what was wrong with them. They were giant spirits in their own right. 
They were so morally tall that looking at them, you could see them towering into the sky above the lesser spirits that fill our civilization. They were in fact so tall that they could see over into our camp and discern some of the truths that we hold in the field of ethics. But when you looked from their towering height down to their feet, it was immediately seen that they were standing in the country of death on the far side of a bottomless canyon that separates us from them. They are lost souls who look across the abyss and see some of our truths, accept the truths without accepting all of the concomitants of those truths, without accepting their foundation in Christ. They do not have the spirit of Christ because they reject the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are therefore none of his. Perhaps the outstanding example of our generation is that of Gandhi. In his diary, the great Hindu tells frankly how he considered the claims of Christ and rejected them. His innate moral height caused him to see many truths of kindness, justice, equity, and human righteousness. Some, even Christians who should have known better, were deceived by the fact that he died repeating the name of his God, Ram, Ram, Ram. But Elijah would have known immediately that Baal was not Jehovah, and we should know immediately that Ram is not Jehovah. And we should know that the intelligence of the natural man is an earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom, while the righteousness of the natural man is the refined righteousness of Adam, that the holiness of the natural man is filthy beyond compare in the eyes of the thrice holy God. No, our text is true. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, through redemption that comes with faith in his blood, then that man is none of his. Now, the Lord willing, we shall go on in our text next week to see the positive force of the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those who do belong to Christ. And our God and Father, we pray thee to use to thy glory that which we put forth today. Give restlessness to any who have not been saved, that they may come to put their trust in our Savior and to know him as our Lord. We ask it with all praise to thee, now and forever. Amen.